tonight. I'm privileged to introduce Larry Rutman, the author behind American Jews and American Skiing. He has also written Voices of Brookline, a book that Howard Zinn called A Model of How an Oral History of a Town Ought to be Written. In, America's, in American Jews and America's Game, Larry weaves together American Jewish history and the history of Jews in baseball <coughs> on and off the field over the past 80 years in 43 personal stories of famous Jews in baseball, speaking in their own words in conversations with Larry. Sports Collector Digest chose this book as the best baseball book of 2013, and our own manager, Dana Brigham, praised this book, delighting in its warm and folksy style with interviews and photos, and declaring that this book will be a classic in the sport and in the religion. Larry Rutman has lived in Brookline all his life and graduated from Brookline High School in 1948 with Booksmith's own founder, Marshall Smith. He's an alum of UMass Amherst and Boston College Law School and served as an officer in the Air Force during the Korean War. And he has also practiced law in Brookline for the last 56 years. So please join me in welcoming Larry Rutman. <laughs> Must be somebody else. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much, and I appreciate that, Jamie. Um, Barney, how are you tonight? I'm well, thank you. I mean, I, want to make, I, I, I wanted you? them to hear your voice right away because, you know, uh, I've never seen you in a beard before, and they probably haven't either. No, no. And I just wanted them to know from your voice that it's really you. Well, my voice, actually, I learned early on that I couldn't get away with anonymous phone calls. My voice, is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my voice has not changed. No, that's good. But Barney, you know, seriously speaking, I want to make an attempt, if you'll bear with me and folks bear with me for a few minutes, because Barney has a special place in, uh, in history, uh, and not only as a Massachusetts politician, but as an American politician. And so I'm going to make a little bit of an attempt as an oral historian to try and put him in the proper place. I mean, I could tell you the, the things you all know, that he served 32 years in the Congress, eight years in the state legislature, and in 40 years he's an undefeated politician and uh, a lot of times he didn't have much opposition but other times it seems like uh, the forces were lined up against him and he still won like in 1982 when they gerrymandered him into a district with Margaret Heckler and he still carried the election so that uh, an undefeated politician and you know that he's been totally honest he's done the right thing there's never been a hint that he's some sort of a corrupt politician uh, quite the opposite He's been that unusual politician that nobody ever doubted that he was always trying to do the right thing. And who was he trying to do it for? He was trying to do it for the people who were dispossessed in our society. Poor, uh, poor people, underprivileged, vulnerable uh, people. And he's always been working for that his whole life. Uh, the well-named uh, Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act 2010 and the credit card holders Bill of Rights Act. I do want to mention those because that is really the culmination of his career and again trying to do the right thing to reform a financial system that's gone wrong and is still wrong. So we'll, we'll wonder about that. Uh, I've been a lucky guy because when I went to BC Law School, Father Drynan was my dean. We became fast friends then and I was fast friends with him until the day he died. He always helped me. He was Barney's predecessor. Two men of quite different styles, but two men who were interested in the same thing. And uh, until, so 10 years for Father Drynan, I was lucky to know him. And then I got to know Barney not at the beginning of his career in Congress, but toward the end, and he's been wonderful to me, just like Father Drynan was. And these are two guys that rank with the greatest congressmen ever. And, uh, and I, I don't know whether we have uh, Joe Kennedy here tonight, maybe not, but uh, he is doing very well so far, and uh, maybe that particular uh, thing will go on. I think that um, I don't usually read from anything in my book, but I do want to read something tonight, and that is how I finished the story on Barney Frank. You may wonder why Barney Frank is in a baseball book, and we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> to continue the baseball anal analogy, Barney Frank has already been Rookie of the Year in Congress. That's a long time ago. Bids fair to be the most valuable congressman for 2009, and could be a well, this is written a few years ago, and could be a multiple MVP winner in the future. When all is said and done, Congressman Barney Frank will be a first ballot shoe-in for the Congressional Hall of Fame, standing tall beside such modern, stalwart Massachusetts heavy hitters as Speakers of the House Joseph W. Martin, Jr., John W. McCormick, 
and Tip O'Neill, his own predecessor in Congress, Father Robert F. Drynan, former Democratic presidential candidates in 1988 and 2004, respectively, Mike Dukakis and three-time Governor Mike Dukakis, and present longtime United States Senator John F. Kerry, now Secretary of State, and Edward M. Kennedy, uh, the iconic senator who passed away, and President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Certainly, Bonnie Frank can be mentioned with all those people. I just want to carry it one step further, Bonnie. I don't know whether you've ever thought of what I'm about to say, but I do want to mention that, and another famous uh, politician, Robert Kennedy, from the present time. We don't want to diss the Republicans either, because in this century there's been, yeah, you know, Massachusetts is a, is a place where all these people come from. It's incredible. Um, on both sides of the aisle, Calvin Coolidge, Leverett Saltonstall, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., and Mitt Romney. I spent uh, a lot of time in my office yesterday Googling all these guys, and some of the records that, they've, uh, that they did were fantastic. But let's go back to the 18th century, to Sam Adams, Sam Adams beer, John Hancock, Elbridge Jerry, famous in, uh, in Barney's career because he's the guy that came up with gerrymandering, John Adams, the second president of the United States, and in the, 18th, in the 19th century, we got Daniel Webster, Charles Sumner. Daniel Webster was a senator, Charles Sumner was a senator, John Quincy Adams was a president, and God knows how many other things. And what I was suggesting, Barney, is that I look for somebody back then who was, I, you know, probably John Quincy Adams. His presidency was okay, but his real fame came after his presidency when he served his last 17 years of life in the in the house and it's in the house that John and there's lots of points of similarity between the career of John Quincy Adams and you Barney um, and this guy John Quincy Adams was incredible I mean he was ambassador to Russia Prussia Netherlands England he was the senator before he became the president he was a professor at Harvard and then he was the uh, he became as I say a congressman for all this time so okay, the last 17 years of his life as a United States congressman doesn't compare quite with uh, Barney's 30, but it's close. <laughs> he was considered a moral leader in an age of modernization and easy communication. Don't forget that around that time the telegraph came into being, the railroad came into being, people were getting news much faster, and he realized that communication had changed, people were getting news of whatever much more quickly, and he tried to impose a, a moral code upon that, or a moral feeling. And the same thing is true in Barney's career. In this present age of instant communications, internet and so forth, he is trying to preserve uh, something moral in a communication revolution that's gone wild and really threatens democracy in many ways. Uh, Adams championed free speech in the House, demanding that petitions against slavery be heard, despite a gag rule saying they could not be heard. He got around that. He became a real pain in the neck to the Southern people, and they really respected him. And, you know, a parallel right there with Barney, he just didn't, you know, quietly uh, stop and go away. He made sure his voice was heard, even before he became the chairman of the uh, banking committee. And not only Adams was for internal improvements. You know, it's like Barney not being for the military, wanting to deflate the military so that uh, money goes to more things like people who need it, infrastructure and so forth. Uh, and uh, so he was responsible for the Smithsonian Institution, the United States Naval Observatory, I think infrastructure. And um, by the way, Barney, I read, uh, you said recently that uh, you um, would have taken the uh, oath of office on a book of constitutional law, not the Bible. I think you said that on Bill Maher's show, if you had been selected to be the interim senator. And this is, and so to show you how feisty Adams was, just like, uh, like Barney has been feisty, is that he took the presidential oath of office on a book of constitutional law, not a Bible, just like Barney said he would do if he'd become senator. I think before that time he followed the usual protocol. All right, Adams was a professor of rhetoric and oratory at Harvard, and Barney is going to tell us he's going to be a professor at Harvard, what he's going to do. And 
you know, Adams preferred, he was, you know, he was a, he was a guy that had a real uh, confrontational character and feistiness. He really preferred reading in seclusion to being out there glad-handing at social events. Sounds like somebody I know. Walter Coakley? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I want you all to join with me not only in welcoming Barney back, but also in appreciation for all he's done for us for the last 30 years. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I, I had one, one historical question, because I noticed, uh, I heard today that they named the ABC News Building for someone who must have been in school with you, not your classmate, Barbara Walters. Are you in Brooklyn High with No, no, she, she's, can you believe it? She's older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought maybe in school at the same time, but she's a Brooklyn High graduate, and just made the ABC News building for her. Oh, wow. I really appreciate John Quincy Adams. He spent the last 17 years of his life crusading against slavery, and they tried to shut him up, and, uh, um, he was in direct contrast to Daniel Webster, who spent his time trying to paper over things so slavery could be, uh, uh, could be continued. There is actually a 19th century house member who I would like to, who, who I somewhat had in mind when I did some of my things. Um, and if you saw the movie Lincoln, you saw him uh, with his wig with Thaddeus Stevens from Pennsylvania, uh, and I, I want to read some more about him, who was a dedicated uh, believer in racial equality at that time and a major opponent of uh, slavery. I also want to say, and I'm very glad to be here at an independent bookstore and to have a chance to say publicly how appalled I was, I don't know if some of you read this, the story I read at the New York Times, that Amazon is now censoring books published by Hatchet, uh, Hatchet however it's pronounced, because they're having a dispute with them over uh, book pricing. So if you order one of their books, uh, Malcolm Gladwell apparently is one of the, their authors, um, they, they delay it. So I would hope people would come and buy books from bookstores. And, uh, not, not <laughs> and it's not just a case of, of, of the commerce thing, but it's, it's a power that they are abusing. I was appalled to see that people, uh, people order a book from Amazon it's published by uh, Hatchet, and they uh, are told Hatchet, Hatchet, merci. <laughs> and um, people order from Hatchet, and they are told that book's not available. Why don't you? You might enjoy this or that book that's similar. Really outrageous. So I'm glad people are going to be here, and everybody buy a book in addition to Irish book. Come back and buy another book here. This is I, I got two book. books for sale. Oh, all right. <laughs> And uh, do you do two fees, or are they going to pay for each one? <laughs> hey, listen, that's up to the bookstore. All right. I, uh, and I look forward to coming back. I have a, I just finished a manuscript uh, of a book about my life and about politics during that time, which uh, will probably be out next March. So I look forward to coming back and, uh, and doing one of these on, on my own. And I'm obviously very happy to come back to uh, Bookline. And, uh, uh, when Larry talked to me about baseball, it's among my early memories. I grew up in New Jersey. I was a Yankee fan, and um, in fact, I borrowed the uh, I, I borrowed something when I have been advocating for people to vote Democratic for the United States Senate. The United States Senate control will be at, at uh, up for grabs, and I've told a couple of Democratic Senate candidates actually one in Michigan, the one running in Maine. Uh, New Hampshire, Kane Sheen. They should follow a technique that my friends and I used to follow when we were younger. When I was growing up in the 40s and into the mid 50s, the New York metropolitan area had three teams. We had the New York Giants, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the Yankees. And people in Brooklyn were for the Dodgers, but people everywhere else in the metropolitan area did not have that favoritism. People in the Bronx weren't necessarily Yankee fans or people in Manhattan weren't necessarily Giants fans. So we would argue about which team was better. And the way we would do it would be, okay, let's go player for player. And who got the best catcher? It would be Yogi Berra versus Roy Campanella, uh, Mickey Mantle and, and Willie Mays and Duke Snyder. You would go position by position, man for man, who was it? 
and I suggested to these Democratic candidates for the Senate, they adapt that. I've explicitly given them on And look at who's going to be chairs of Senate committees. And you want Barbara Boxer, who's a great environmentalist, or Jim Inhofe, who thinks communists made up the whole issue of global warming. Uh, who do you want? Do you want Patrick Leahy to run the Judiciary Committee or uh, somebody much further to the right? So I, I really have explicitly borrowed on an old tactic from my uh, fandom days in, uh, in, in the 40s and 50s. And it, I have to say, it works very well. You just look at who's going to be the chairman of this committee and that committee and the other committee, and it, and it makes the case. You know, I just want to point out that there's a couple of people here I want to draw attention to. Um, one uh, is his family. Uh, his have, have been great supporters of Barney, so Barney won't mind this, I'm sure. And that is that Peter Rothstein, who is the retiring president of, uh, of the uh, Perkins School for the Blind, who has turned that institution from a local or uh, stateside institution into an international institution in 11 short years, and uh, whose mother and father, uh, Alan and Natalie, uh, are my very good friends from long ago at Brookline High School. So, uh, Peter, I want, I want you to stand up so the folks can see you. No, no, stand up, Peter. There he is. Well, I, I do mind only because when Alan and Natalie Wasteen were having one of my first house parties back in 1980 through the auspices of a former book on state representative, Jimmy Siegel, who's been my closest friend for all these years, um, uh, Peter was about six, I think, or nine or something. So having him be old enough to be, or maybe 10, but <laughs> having him be old enough to be the retired president of anything other than his high school class does remind me that the years have gone by. And another person, you know, excuse me if I miss somebody because with my failing eyesight, I can't see everybody. But um, there is a gentleman sitting here who's a, who's a national legend, and that is Rand Blake who's sitting over here. Rand is a MacArthur Grant winner. He's a uh, Guggenheim winner. He's uh, a professor for many years at the um, New England Conservatory of Music. He's famous as a composer and a piano player, and he's a marvelous guy, a selfless guy, a humanistic guy, as we might talk about tonight. Rand, hi. How are you? Thanks so much for coming. Um, you know, you, you might say to yourself, uh, uh, did, does uh, Barney Frank have a, a baseball career? I mean, why was he in this book? Well, I finally got to the point where I decided that fans of baseball could be in the book. But Barney Frank actually has had a baseball career, but it began late. He wasn't, he wasn't elected to the Congress until he was uh, 40. He was born in 1940, he was elected in 1980. But shortly after that time, and, you, and I'm not going to show you the picture in the book. There's a couple of pictures in the book in the chapter on Barney Frank. One is the baseball card devoted to Barney Frank. Shows him in a left-handed batting stance, and he looks really threatening. He looks like a great left-handed slugger. And the other one is a picture I took when I interviewed him six years ago in his office in Newton. I can't believe that it's that long ago that I don't know whether he thinks so, but I think it's a great picture of him because it shows everything about Barney that we know about Barney, but there's a little hint of a smile there. Um, and uh, <laughs> so that, uh, but um, his baseball career began with, he, he had his own team, did you know that? The Congressional Franks. Oh, by the way, here's my button. And the button I think says something like, uh, uh, Read that to me, Barney. What does it say? Frankie, I'd rather have Barney. I never thought much of this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your career as a baseball player in the... Uh... Well, actually, I started, out, I, I started playing when I was a kid, and I, I still have, I don't know, I, I guess actors, method actors talk about sense memory. I still have a sense memory, um, well, maybe fading a little bit, but in, uh, what, no, in March or April, when it is sort of transitioning from cold to a little warmer. There are days when I still feel in my hands the feeling you would get, because when I was a kid we were using wooden bats, and the feel you would get when you took a cold bat and hit a cold ball, and you felt a kind of tingling in your hands. And I, I mean literally would still be reminded of that. Um, so I played unorganized uh, in, in uh, most of the time, but I did uh, the when I got to Congress, there uh, was, there is still a congressional softball league, which 
uh, each, each officers are able to form teams. And sometimes people, uh, and they're supposed to think of clever names. Uh, actually, um, my predecessor, not my, but my colleague who, who since left and died, Gary Studs, who bears the name of Elbridge Gary, as in Gary Man, from the family, he formed a joint team with uh, the first African American congressman from Georgia, Andrew Young. And uh, guess what that team was called? Young Studs. The Young Studs. <laughs> yeah. I will say, I don't know, we, people can, I won't, it's an adult audience. Um, two other of my colleagues from the state of Washington who did represent a joining district, um, <coughs> Norman Dix and Al Swift, refrained from joining their names in a, uh, in a team, but that is literally they, they thought about it. Um, but um, because I had this team I was playing for a while, in 1982, Mary mentioned the congressional race against Margaret Heckle, which I got elected in 80, and then my district was substantially uh, just cut up and new lines were drawn. And the only two communities that remained in the same district for me were Newton and Brooklyn. And fortunately for me, with Brooklyn had always been very nice to me. And um, I was running against Margaret Heckle, who was suggesting that I did not share most values with most Americans on a wide variety of issues. So we did a number of commercials to counter that. Some of you may remember uh, the most effective was a, uh, a very handsome older woman sitting in her living room talking about why she knew that I would be very much a strong defender of the rights of senior citizens and closed with a kind of a shy smile saying, and if you want to know why I'm so sure, he's my son. It was my mother who... <laughs> uh, did that. But um, we also did want to deal with the other sets of issues. So we did a commercial, which I just saw again because it's in a documentary that was made about me, and a great uh, producer of, of, of political commercials and TV, Dan Payne, came up with it. It is a picture of me hitting a softball, circling the bases, and sliding home just ahead of the tag. Um, which we did, but it turns out it's very difficult to coordinate sliding home just ahead of a tag. And uh, they had the guy out there in right field and he was throwing and then they suddenly joined to me, wait a minute, they asked the cameraman, how much of this is going to be shown? Well, they were going to show about 15 feet up. So I came up with the obvious solution. We had the guy with the ball 20 feet from the plate and on the right field side and the first base side. So as I began my slide, he tossed the ball, so it was time that I would get there just ahead of the ball. Because trying to do it the other way was very hard. But that, that is in my documentary that uh, maybe will be shown here. So there is a, at least one action shot. And in my back wall of my office, I can't find it. I think my husband hit it. I think Jimmy was, thought it was kind of tacky, although he's been a very vigorous athlete himself. But I was playing softball. The state legislators were playing the media down in Town Field in Dorchester. And there was a great shot of me sliding home, and uh, uh, John Doyle, who was then a police uh, superintendent, snapped a great picture of me sliding home just ahead of the tag. And it was kind of like what you would see on the back page of the tabloids when they you know, still had movie slides. Well, I don't know if the Herald still has those. I don't pay much attention to it. But um, uh, it, I had it blown up, and it was the back wall of my office in Washington. In fact, that reminds me, I'm going to go find that. Put it in my office. Yeah, Barney, I'm going to get away from baseball a little, maybe into something more serious. I want to say to the people that uh, if you want to know what my book is about, you're hearing it, and um, some of it is baseball, but a lot of it is very serious stuff. There was a review that came out yesterday of, uh, that I really I liked because it said that the book is a serious book about uh, Jewish American life over the last uh, 80 years, and that's true. That's really what I was about. I just wasn't interested in only baseball. Baseball was really a backdrop for other stuff. So that um, I think that, uh, and I don't have to tell you what the book is about because as Barney answers these questions, he's telling you the kind of stuff that appears in the book in the 43 stories about a bunch of famous Jewish Americans associated with baseball players and otherwise. Uh, I do want to say, I, you know, when I say I'm getting into something more serious, um, Barney told me when I interviewed him, of course, that he grew up Jewish, he had a bar mitzvah, he's not a particularly observant Jew uh, into his adulthood. But he certainly was culturally Jewish, believed in a lot of 
things that uh, Jews believe in as far as values are concerned. Um, and, uh, but I do notice that he's uh, about to receive a very nice award over at Harvard, and that is the Outstanding Lifetime Achievement Award in Cultural Humanism, which is presented each year by the Humanist Community at Harvard, the American Humanist Association, and the Harvard Community of Humanists, Atheists, and Agnostics, selected uh, by a committee of undergraduates uh, in his career in politics and his superlative uh, uh, for his career in politics and superlative contribution to humanism in the public sphere. Well, there's no question about that. A previous winner, a famous, famous people like Salman Rushdie, and you know, it's an award that's well earned. Uh, as for myself, um, my definition of humanism, and I consider myself a humanist, is uh, one that uh, you can believe in God, and I think a Jew can, uh, uh, you can be a Jew either believing in God or not believing in God, but um, uh, I guess I would call myself a uh, theist uh, um, uh, or a deist, uh, somebody who believes that there is a God, but not one that directs and watches over everybody individually. I think we're in it for us. I think we've got to do it ourselves. But in any event, uh, Barney um, declared, as I said before, that he's now an atheist. And the question I wanted to ask him uh, was whether, whether that's compatible with Judaism. Uh, I think it can be, but he'll answer what he thinks and whether he still identifies as Jewish. Yeah, in fact, um, when I, I was half kidding when I was on the Bill Maher show and he said something about he couldn't find any politician brave enough to sit next to a pot-smoking atheist, and I said, well, I'm here. Um, <laughs> I can, that's only partly true, because I do not smoke marijuana. I, uh, I ingest it. I, I, I have a sinus condition, and the first time I tried marijuana, I had trouble inhaling, but Bill Clinton forever moved that as a plausible explanation. I could say it, and people would thought, oh, I, you know, what's next? So um, uh, my basic answer is that the whole, that I haven't given it enough emotional commitment to actually be an atheist. I, I don't believe in anything beyond what I can see, touch, feel, et cetera, and I haven't thought about it. Um, but yeah, I still consider myself Jew, Jewish, and someone asked me, I was interviewed, by one journalist who said, well, how come you weren't more explicit about that when you were in office? And that was a fair question. I did not, in office, participate very much in religious activity. I did it first, and then I felt that was not honest. Um, I would make a point of observing Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur uh, to the extent of not appearing in public. I wouldn't go to work, because if I were to do that, that could then be used to undercut the legitimacy of other Jewish people who stayed out. In fact, I remember that was very interesting because the day that Bill Clinton's grand jury testimony was on television was uh, one of the high holy days in 2000, in 1998. And I remember well, I was sort of watching at home and wondering what the reaction was going to be. But um, I, and you mentioned about my taking the oath, I actually never put my hand on the Bible because <clears throat> Members of the House of Representatives take the oath en masse. So all 434 of us, actually, the senior guy gets sworn in first, and then he swears in the others or affirms. So all 434 of the others stand in the well of the house, in the in the House and and say what they're going to say. So I never swore, but there were 433 other people. Nobody knew what the hell I was saying or cared. Um, <laughs> But I didn't make a point of it for this reason. It, it, it is exactly what you say. Obviously, Judaism has been beleaguered through the centuries. I think one of the nice things about American political and social life is the extent to which anti-Semitism has diminished. I say in the book I've written that in 1954, when I thought about politics, I saw two obstacles to my having a good political career. One was the fact that I was gay, and the other was the fact that I'm, that I'm Jewish. And at the time, I thought being Jewish was the greater obstacle, uh, mainly because I planned to deal with the gay part by never telling anyone, but I had already outed myself with a bar mitzvah. Uh, <laughs> and it was too late to deny that I was Jewish. And, I, I just, and, and it has continued to be, obviously, a source of discrimination. I did not want to make public that I was a non-believer in religion, because it would have been interpreted as a dissociation to some extent of myself from Judaism. And I did not want any way to contribute to that. Now, 
Once I got out of office, I didn't think there was as much danger because when you're in office, there are people who make a living by distorting what you say and taking it out of context. Uh, my context is much less important to people these days. So my chance to say things and, and explain it on my terms without it being distorted is much greater. So that's why I feel much freer now to say, you know, I'm very Jewish. My associations, my, my interests, the humor I like, the food I eat, I feel very much identified as Jew. But I, uh, I don't have any theistic content. I will tell you this, I'm, you know, nobody's asked me for my advice. But my, if I had been asked, I would have advised both the Roman Catholic Church and Judaism uh, including the reform, obviously, the wing to which I did most actively belong when I was involved. Uh, I think Judaism and Catholicism made a mistake when they translated all that stuff into English. Because in either Hebrew or Latin, it has a certain majesty and impressive <laughs> rhythm. In English, I don't think so much of it, to be honest with you. It does not uh, read that well to me in terms of the logic of it all. Uh, or the personality of the Almighty that is revealed in this constant demand for adulation. Um, so I might have stayed uh, religious if I'd ever read what it said. Uh, <laughs> but there you are. Well, okay, Barney, we're going to return to Earth now. And <laughs> well, I, I never left. <laughs> uh, I want to say that, um, you know, Friendship is, you know, friendship is a Jewish value, and friendship is shown in various ways. Now, Barney is not a—he's not, not the kind of guy in public or private that's going to fall all over you. But he's been a great friend to me, um, without, uh, you know, without expressions of warmth that you might expect from from other people. I mean, you know, it really inheres in what a person does rather than what one says. Um, in my first book, Voices of Brookline, uh, if you look on the website for that, he wrote a wonderful endorsement when he, when he said things like, uh, he really encouraged me on writing the book and said it was like visiting uh, when I read it with old friends that I hadn't seen for a while. Uh, and a lot of Brookline people in there, maybe 60 interviews and stories just like in the other book. And, uh, uh, and uh, he said really wonderful things. And then when I thought about writing this book, he, here's the letter right here. He wrote me a letter in which he said, uh, having very much enjoyed your book about Brookline, I look forward to reading the book you discuss about the Jewish presence in Major League Baseball. And he just spoke about this. I remember very much as a Jewish kid my great desire to learn more about Jewish baseball players, and I think that is an entirely healthy expression of legitimate ethnic pride. Of course, the book would have a far broader appeal than just to those of us who are Jewish, and I think the approach you have described would do the job very well. Please feel free to share with anyone who might be interested in my enthusiasm for this project. Not sincerely, not very truly yours, not, you know, uh, just Barney. But w w what more could you expect from anybody than a letter like this? So it was extremely encouraging. Now, Barney doesn't have to come here tonight. He's doing it because he wants to help me. This is the kind of guy he is. Um, so that, um, as I say, you can tell a lot more from, from actions than you can from from anything else. And of course, uh, as he said to me when I interviewed him six years ago, that in private, of, when he lets down the, uh, when he's not in the public arena, he's uh, like any of us, uh, you know, he has uh, warm relationships and wants to have those. You know, Barney, uh, I have a lot of questions for you, and I, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think people might be more interested in the book, frankly, and uh, I, I assume some people might want to talk about what's in the book. Well, you know, as I said, I mean, just talking to you, no, I, 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 I will say this, that, um, you know, the stories in there are, there are a lot of players, Jewish players, and people like uh, Bud Selig who wrote the foreword for the book, and also um, uh, in there is um, uh, Alan Dershowitz, who's another fan, but uh, players like Ian Kinsler and so forth, but, um, Barney, there's a lot of questions I want to ask you, never going to get to them all, um, and we are going to have some questions from the audience, and I will say, that um, some of these I'm not going to ask, but you may think of asking them, and that is, uh, uh, well, uh, Barney, you know, I would say that about the Dodd-Frank bill, maybe somebody will ask about uh, whether Barney thinks that is making headway and is liable to change the uh, system. Uh, and, um, but let me ask a, a few others to you, Barney. Maybe, maybe you can give us some quick answers to these. Um, it, first of all, um, I know you're supporting Hillary Clinton for the presidency, even though she hasn't announced. 
Are you going to have a position in her campaign? Not a formal one, no. I, uh, I'm beyond wanting to take on any responsibility. I'll do what I can to encourage people to, uh, to vote for her. I, I have no inside knowledge. I expect her to become a candidate. People are wondering what's the game. Well, right now, frankly, she gets very nice fees for speaking. Uh, some of which come from organizations that would probably have a problem giving those fees to an endorsed candidate. In some cases, they might even be considered campaign contributions. So uh, the fact that she has announced, I think, is a recognition of the reality. But I, I don't expect to have, uh, I, I wouldn't be looking for a, a formal position. I just would be an active volunteer. What are you going to be teaching at the Kennedy School? Starting in September at the Kennedy School, I'm going to be teaching uh, the history of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender efforts to win legal equality. I'm kind of uh, in a unique position for that. I filed the first bill for gay rights uh, in 1972, the first one in Massachusetts, when I was the state representative. Uh, and um, I have been on the floor of the House for every debate involving those issues. But one, there was one that happened in 1979. Um, but every debate about it since then, and as long as the Republicans control the House, they won't allow anything else to come up. So I'm, I'm safe by the time I think I start teaching, it will, it'll still be the case. Um, I've been there for every debate and every issue that, uh, that has come up. And I want to talk about the history. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about two issues. Why have we made so much progress more rapidly than people thought? That's very optimistic. And secondly, very important for the civil rights movement of any sort, what are the best strategies and tactics to use? There's been a debate within the lesbian and gay movement, as there is any other, uh, between direct action and the political process. I'm a great believer in, in, in the political process. I think that's what's won. Um, 2009 or whatever it was, or 10, a group of people decided to have another march on Washington in October, Columbus Day weekend, when nobody in Congress was in town to uh, demonstrate for, I don't know, the people don't ask, don't tell, or whatever the issue was. And someone asked me, and I said I thought it was a waste of time, and they said, well, don't you think that having this march on the mall was going to put pressure on Congress? And my answer was that it's only, the only pressure was going to put was on the grass. I mean, they literally, you know, I have a, they just don't, they don't help. That's not how you win. There's a very good book coming out by a man named Mark Solomon, who ran the campaign here in Massachusetts to protect the Supreme Court decision after it came out. And uh, there was a, a very big political fight because the legislature could have put on the ballot a referendum to undo it. Now, if that referendum came up today, it would lose. People would support same-sex marriage. But in the first year of same-sex marriage, it was still new to people. They were still scared of things, and it probably would have lost. So it was important to keep it off the ballot by having the legislature not vote to do that. Mitt Romney made it his number one issue in 2004, namely to try and defeat people who had not voted to put it on the ballot. And we waged a very tough political battle, and we won. And I think this is a very interesting story. We saved same-sex marriage in Massachusetts after the Supreme Court did the right thing, not by demonstrations, but by very tough, sophisticated political lobbying and campaigning. So that's one of the things that I want to address. In the spring, I'm going to give a course at Harvard Law School, although students in both schools can register in either one, which will deal with uh, Congress and legislating. And uh, uh, that's talking about the way Congress works, but, but with a, again, I always want to deal with a broader issue. The question is, what, how should a legislative body function in a, in a democracy? What is the, the, the right way to structure things, and what's the right way for the people to participate? And that's one of the things I want to point out, um, is, is of all the actors in the American political process who are not behaving adequately these days, I think among the worst is the voters. You know, there's nobody in the Congress that got there by parachute. They all got more votes than anybody else in the last election. And uh, I spoke at a commencement yesterday in Pine Manor. And I said, I'm going to be brief, but I want to tell you, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure about two things as I address that audience. This one may be a little different. I'll tell you a Brooklyn story in a minute, which 
indicate that. But um, I said, I'll bet you two things. I'll bet you most of the people here are very unhappy with Congress, and I'll bet you that most of you don't know who your congressman is. And if you don't know who it is, how the hell are you going to fix it? How are you going to make it any better? Now, I don't know that that's true here, because I will tell you, in 1971, I went down to Washington to work for a congressman from the North Shore named Michael Harrington, a very good guy, who was the first Democrat to win that seat in 1969 as an anti-war opponent, an early early Vietnam opponent. And um, Tip O'Neill was then moving up the Democratic leadership. And in 1971, they changed the districts again. That's when Brookline, Brookline used to be in Tip O'Neill's district. And Brookline went out of Tip O'Neill's district and into Father Dryden's district in 1971. And I said to Tip, because I knew him, and I'm just interested, why, why did you get Brookline out of your district? Because he was important enough, so the legislature did what he wanted. I did not realize at the time that I was asking him why he was doing something that was going to make me a congressman. Because if Brookline had not been in the district when I ran in 1980, I would not have won either the primary or the final election. So he was doing me a favor that I didn't know about. But um, he said, Bonnie, I'll tell you the story. I love the Jewish people. They are beautiful people. But those Jewish ladies in Brookline write you so deep in many letters that my staff can't keep up. He <laughs> said, now you know my staff. They're very good people. They can help you with an immigration issue. They'll help you with a problem with the Social Security. But they can't be writing these letters all day. And he said, Bonnie, God love the Jewish people. Don't you want to know something? Those Jewish ladies in Brookline, they write your letters even when they agree with you. Which, <laughs> and so, uh, to, to, now there was also the possibility that this was a time when people like Bob Dwight and others were insurgents, and there was a potential insurgent candidate in Brookline named Michael Dukakis, who might have made Tip nervous, but I think Michael would never run against Tip, and Tip had become kind of a more of a form-oriented guy. And uh, he, he got rid of Brookline. So I, it is apparently the case that the level, and I, this has been my experience, the level of knowledge, interest, and activity in Brookline is above the average. Uh, most people, uh, as I said, the, we wouldn't have a bad Congress if we didn't have lazy voters. You know, Barney, um, you know, because of the limitations of time, I'll try and encaps encapsulate the last questions I have. It really is asking you for a prediction about the future. I think we're all worried about America in a lot of ways. Um, I, you know, I wrote this up because I wanted to be reasonably precise about the question. Um, and there are several questions here, but let me give it to you as well as I can and then take the floor and answer it at whatever length you want. But it goes something like this, given the divisiveness in our society between rich and poor, blacks, whites, men, women, gays, straight, left, right, all reflected in our governing bodies, what does your crystal ball show you as the future for democracy in America as Abraham Lincoln saw it as being, quote, of the people, for the people, and by the people, close quote. I have in mind uh, a number of things, but the new and influential book, Capital in the 21st Century, which argues that inherited wealth in America will subvert democracy. And then in ensuing questions, Barney, I talked about the depredation, at least in my mind, uh, of the five to four decision a week ago from Greece, of all places, New York, that local city and town councils can begin their hearings with prayers, even if offered almost entirely by Christians, and which may offend some. Is that a violation of a demarcation between church and state? And also I talked about I was going to ask you about Citizens United and the McCutcheon case uh, and uh, taking the lid off donations and federal campaigns and anonymous contributions, uh, unlimited, and then about uh, Justice John Paul Stevens' book, Six Amendments, How and Why We Should Change the Constitution, whether we should wait for change uh, by a change in the makeup of the court or whether we should go the two-thirds, three-quarters route by trying to get a uh, change. But I think the basic question, Barney, that I'd like you to address yourself to is, do you see a bad future for America, a bad future for democracy? No, I don't at all. Um, and obviously, I mean, you can't mention all those things, and then say, but don't talk about them. Um, couple, first of all, to John Paul Stevens' issue, no, there's no chance of amending the Constitution. It was made very hard to amend. Um, look, there, that's one of the reasons why the presidential election in 2016 is very important. 
If the person elected in 2016 serves two terms, by the end of his or her second term, there will be at least four justices in their late 80s. And um, uh, the president elected in 2016 will very likely be able to make some appointments. My guess is Scalia is mean enough to stay on until about two years after he's dead. <laughs> but, um, I don't see Justice Kennedy, who's not nearly as right-wing an ideologue, uh, staying on beyond the point when it would make sense for him to leave. Uh, but, but there's no chance of a constitutional amendment. Do you three quarters of the states? I mean, why? Why would anyone think you get three quarters of the states when you know more than them? Well over a quarter of just should banned abortion effectively by saying doctors can't can't practice. Um, you know, in, in the majority of states in America, it's still legal to fire someone if he or she is gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. There is no civil rights protection in employment in in in, in a majority of the states. So why, why even talk about getting a constitutional amendment through? The decision is a terrible one. Um, I said the other day that it, it was an amendment. Somebody said, well, is that, does that comport with Lincoln's for the people, of the people, and by the people? I said, no, it actually it cuts two-thirds out of what Lincoln said and, and, and uh, changes the spelling of another. It is a mandate to politicians to buy the people, be the why. Um, if you have enough money, you can buy the people, and that will be uh, what you need. It's a terrible blow to democracy. It's totally inconsistent. Democracy, we have two systems in this country, a political and a commercial. The commercial system, capitalism, means the more money you have, the more influence you have, and it works okay. Uh, the political system is supposed to be everybody equal. What this Supreme Court has done is allow the unequal principle to overwhelm the equal principle. As to uh, Thomas Piketty's book, he does not say that about America, by the way. He says that is the inherent tendency of capitalism in any free market democracy, that capital will make more money than, uh, than, than uh, product, will, will increase faster than productivity. But he, that is controllable. As to the future, I, I, I would divide it. You mentioned divisiveness. With regard to sexism, racism, religious discrimination, anti-gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender feelings. We are much better today than we were at any time in the past. We've made enormous progress in every one of those areas. There's no question that prejudice to some extent is there. Anti-Semitism has largely disappeared as a factor in American life, except for violence from some crazies, but it's not a social, economic, or political factor. Um, the uh, LGBT issue, we are on the way to complete victory, and in mo much of the country, you're free of any prejudice, and there are still some problems getting better. Uh, the role of women, uh, race, there are still racist issues, but clearly there's been a substantial diminution of actual racial prejudice. There is one single problem. And by the way, and our political system was functioning well through 2010. 2008, when George Bush was president, Democrats like myself cooperated with him in the face of a national crisis. And then when the Democrats had the House, the Senate, and the presidency, we had a very good two years. The health care bill, the financial reform bill, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, legislation approving the ability of women to sue if they had been suffering from wage discrimination. What happened was two things. The country became very angry because of the, frustratingly, because of the recession. They started blaming the Democrats, for instance, for the bailouts. There were four bailouts in American history of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, of AIG, of the banks in general, and of the automobile industry. Every one of those four was initiated by George W. Bush. Two of them Bush carried out entirely on his own. The other two, Democrats cooperated, but they all started under Bush. But we got blamed for it. And at the same time, it was a bad coincidence, the angriest, most extreme faction in a long time in America took over the Republican Party. And that's the problem. Uh, uh, our system hasn't broken down. It was working until recently. But the problem is that the voters have elected and reelected uh, a lot of dysfunctional people in the Republican Party. And what, what has to happen is that has to work out. And I'm hoping 2014, the sixth year of a president's term, is never a good one. 2016 will be a critical election. Um, there are two possible healthy outcomes. One, the Republican Party mainstream conservatives take their party back. That seems to be unlikely at this point. Uh, and I'm not talking about liberals. There's no more Red Book or Frank Sargent or Marty Linsky or Frida Kapo to go to people from, from, from Brooklyn, Teddy Mann or Newton. I'm talking about Bob Dole, who are not 
in the mainstream of their party anymore. Either they come back, or if the right wing maintains its hold on the Republican Party, then the Democrats will win big in 2016, and that will engender that kind of a reaction. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. It's one fear, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that I hear from many people, including some of my friends on the left, that everything is terrible, that only big money counts, and there's no point in paying any attention to the political system because that's what the bad guys need to keep winning. The best thing that will happen for the right wing this year is if the turnout is low. So if everybody in this room not only votes, but grabs a few people that you know who aren't going to vote and say, what's the point of voting, and gets them to vote, and we replicate that, then things begin to get better. Okay, we're going to have some questions. and. Um, just to deferring to Barney saying about talking about my book, that's the kind of stuff that's in the book. I mean, I asked all these people questions, uh, serious questions like that. Who would like to uh, have a question? Here? What was Kevin Euclid's position on McCutcheon? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin said, uh, when he, I think I interviewed him before McCutcheon. Okay. <laughs> Eric, back to baseball. Tell us more about your review yesterday. Where was it? Uh, there, uh, the review yesterday was uh, by a guy um, who is uh, at Oneonta in New York. The question was about the review yesterday that Harry mentioned. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not speaking into this. Uh, yeah, Rand, thanks very much for asking that. Um, well, you know, uh, my own publisher, the University of Nebraska Press, kind of insisted that this was a baseball book, and, uh, but they were very nice. They let me in on the publication process so that I was able to publish more rather than less. And um, I put in all the things I wanted to put in. And several reviewers recognized it as uh, something other than the usual baseball book. And uh, this review yesterday, which was uh, by this professor at Oneonta in New York, uh, whose name is uh, William Simon, I think. Uh, and uh, he's connected with the Baseball Hall of Fame, but he's a, he's a historian in several fields. And he's, he called it a significant book in uh, having to do with recounting American Jewish history through this one field of people who have become eminent or successful in that particular field. And uh, th that's, a, that's a brief way of putting it. But that was very satisfactory to me because uh, it, it is indeed the way, the way I think of it. I mean, if you read the, the interview with Barney, for example, I'd say that well, you know, Barney's a great baseball enthusiast, so maybe 30% of it was about baseball, but we moved on to other things, and that's really what's in there. Maybe not to the extent that Barney just answered, but it's there. So thank you, Rand, for that question. Um, anybody else? Yeah, way back there. By the way, that's another well-known Brookline author back there who's uh, speaking. State your name, please. Chuck Oldstow. And he wanted me to do that because well, I do have an idea about, you know, you spoke about communications, and I do have an idea for another book that has to do with uh, the, influence of, uh, the influence of the media as far as the voting habits of the American public is concerned. I don't know whether it'll come to be or it won't come to be. I don't, want, don't really want to say too much more about it, but I think communications is plainly a major issue in American society today. And um, so that uh, it's along those lines. It's really in a very uh, fledgling stage because of the fact that um, I've been very busy on this particular book. I'm having a lot of fun with it uh, and uh, meeting a lot of people. It's been a, a, a lifetime experience for a guy that has reached the age I've reached. Uh, and uh, but I do want to do something else because it's uh, it's you know I've been talking to guys like Barney and uh, and other people that are so well known has been a uh, I never thought that would happen. It all happened after I was 70 years old, and it's been a wonderful experience because uh, um, I, you know, it's just great talking to these people and hearing their ideas and learning what I can from them and being privileged to be pass it on to readers who seem to like the way I put it out there. So that's nice. Oh, I'm a great fan of uh, Elizabeth Warren. I, uh, her, in her new book, she talks about how when, when I first met her, we were talking about 
he was talking about the consumer bill. I was at the opinion at the time, 2007, that it would be politically impossible to enact. But uh, then came the crash, and the crash created a new political atmosphere. So uh, she recounts the time she came to my apartment in Newton, and um, we talked about it. Uh, in fact, again, there's a Brookline angle because she was I live in a complex in Newton near the uh, Riverside stop next to LaSalle, which is numbered in the most bizarrely uh, irrational fashion I have ever seen. I went, we went, Jim and I came home and I had a cop trying to find the number there. Um, and uh, she was wandering around the complex when, as she notes, Jimmy Siegel reached his head out the window and yelled, Elizabeth, up here. And she came up. So we worked very closely together. Uh, she is a wonderful combination of Commitment, passion, and political skills and common sense. Um, you know, too often people get so committed to their ideas that they forget about the need to get things done, or they are so focused on getting things done that the ideals slip. Um, she is, she is a uh, very good combination of both. We worked very well together during the uh, legislation. I was a strong advocate for her to become the. Uh, as the bureau, but I it also was one of the first that she said to suggest that if she didn't get that, that she run for the Senate, and I think she she's doing great and will continue to do great. Yeah. Over here. When do you think uh, we'll be ready for a Bernie Sanders Elizabeth Warren ticket? Oh <laughs> Never. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you? You, you, you exemplify one of the problems we have. We the, most active, the most active people in politics live in parallel media universes. People tend only to listen and hear from people they agree with. And to be honest, if you had kind of a broader exposure, you would understand that. And then, I will say this, by the way, I do not equate the two. I think Elizabeth is much better than Bernie Sanders at presenting that agenda in, a, in, a, uh, in an appealing way. And Bernie tends to ex emphasize more of the, the, the angry part, which is an important piece of it. But uh, you know, there are roles you play. If you decide to be the one who, I, mean, I felt that when Bella Abzug ran for the Senate in 1976, I thought she was making a great mistake. She went from being a very effective congressional conscience to being a defeated Senate candidate because you, you she was playing very effectively the role of pushing and pushing and pushing in a very safe district to an area where a broader constituency wasn't ready uh, to accept that. And um, uh, this is a big country with a broad range of differences. <coughs> and one of the things we have to do, and that's one of the things Elizabeth is good at, is figuring out how best to do those. But even then, you might get one or the other, but the notion that you would have two people from the same particular faction ignores the fact it's a broad country and you need you need uh, um, actually you need a majority to win could she and somebody else win oh i think elizabeth, if, if hillary clinton didn't run i think elizabeth warren uh, would be a very plausible candidate for president she has a very good way of presenting uh, very firm principled liberal ideas in, in a way that maximizes their uh, their appeal and she's conscious of that she's conscious of the need to to, to appeal uh broadly and yeah, I think an Elizabeth Warren ticket with a uh, vice president of a more moderate seeming, uh, still basically right on the important issues could win. But I think that's academic because uh, I, I believe Hillary Clinton is going to decide to run. And the day Hillary Clinton decides to run, um, I, neither Elizabeth Warren or any other Democrat will contest it. Great, and we have time for two more questions. Two more questions, okay? Who wants? Um, fine. Possibility of the future of eliminating the um, electoral college? No, I wish we could. It's a terrible idea. It is very distorting politically. Um, but it is a defender, it greatly overrepresents precisely those states who would have to vote to change it. And the American Constitution <laughs> is very hard to amend. Three quarters of the states. It's, I mean, for two thirds of both houses of Congress, you could conceivably get at some point. But three quarters of the states, you know, go home and start counting states Mississippi, Idaho, Utah, 
It's not going to take you long to get the 13. 13 states blocks a constitutional amendment, Alaska. And uh, these are all states that are grossly overrepresented by the electoral college. So the answer, sadly, I'm afraid, is, uh, is, is no. There is one thing people have suggested, which is you get a bunch of states to agree that their electors will vote for the person that gets the majority of the vote, rather than just who carries his or her state. But the problem is if some states do that and some don't, I mean, it's all the states that you would like would vote to give away their own autonomy. So I think the American Constitution is unfortunately unamendable in that regard, practically. One more? No? I'll end with a baseball question. Are we going to see a repeat from the Red Sox? <laughs> <laughs> One of the advantages of no longer being in office is that I uh, am able to avoid telling people more than I know on any <laughs> Even when I was in office, I tried to do that, but there would be pressure to do it. Now, the answer is I have the famous idea. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll tell you why in part, but even here when I was in office, I, I very much agree with the state. I thought that was a terrible opinion, although um, uh, I mean, this, I, I don't know how they justify it. I guess Kennedy said, well, if you don't have a constitutional right not to be offended, um, it, it, that's true by some personal statement, I would think, not by official uh, government action. But I, uh, next to my belief in the separation of church and state, I am a strong believer in the separation of sports and politics. People, <laughs> politics would make a big mistake. In my memory, the only serious politician in Massachusetts who could go to any athletic event and upon being announced, avoid being booed, was the former state auditor Joe Danucci, who was in his own right a first class athlete, almost the national, the middle, the world's middleweight champion. But they boo everybody else. I, Jim, I and I would go to the Patriots game a couple of times and Bob Kraft uh, was a friend and at one point he said, come on, we're, the first time we were up in the bus, we're gonna go out on the field. Yeah. And they all went out on the field. And I said, I'm not going out on the field. <laughs> so Kraft went out, John Bon Jovi went out, and I went out, and I stayed up there and had a couple of clubs. <laughs> but anyway, Barney, you did tell me that you, do, you watch baseball from time to time on TV, right? I, I do watch sometimes, yeah. Uh, let me get my opinion. That'll close the, the event. And that is, I don't think, yeah, that no, t no team seems to be able to repeat lately. And I think you can't win without a shortstop, a third baseman, a center fielder. Uh, and I, I think that David Ortiz, even though he'll probably do okay, I think if you look at his punch this year, as opposed to his slimness last year, you have the answer to why the Red Sox won't repeat, although they're playing in a division where they all seem to be even now. But I'm, vo I'm, I'm hoping Brad Osmus, who's in this book, who was a great major league catcher for 18 years, who's now the manager of the Detroit Tigers. And in this book, I predicted five years ago that that would happen seamlessly without ever being a minor league manager, who's a wonderful guy, who went to Dartmouth, has the third uh, highest uh, fielding average among catchers in major league history. So smart, so nice, so handsome, laterally Jewish. Um, his father was German, his mother was Jewish with a Brookline connection because his grandmother and grandfather were, uh, his grandfather was on the school committee, Jock Dronsick, people will remember, and Adele Dronsick. They were Brookline citizens uh, for a long time. They supported Mike Dukakis. They died in around 2000. He used to come up here when he was a kid, would be taken to Fenway Park with his mother. They lived in Connecticut. So that everything that you know, everything goes around, comes around, so that uh, I'm for Brad Osmus and Detroit, who's already given me a dispensation, um, but because I, I, I said I have to be a Sox fan, can't root for you. He says, it's okay, I understand. Okay, uh, you may have made some metaphorical baseball history, because uh, that was the longest wind-up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you got me. You got her and you got me. Thank you very much to the Brookline Books. And to, uh, and to Jamie and to, uh, uh, to my classmate who founded this store, classmate in 1948, Brookline High School, Marshall Smith. And uh, so it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you.